So let's just talk about humidity for a bit and talk about water. And um, what is water? Um, how does it move? And um, which way does it go? Uh, here's a nice picture of, and in this picture we can see three states of water, all in the same picture, and it's all around the same temperature. So in the background we can see vapour, mist is um, is coming off the water. It's very cold. It's not um, it's not boiling, but there is some um, mist. There's water vapour coming off the water. Um, we can see liquid. Um, there's some flowing water there um, and we can see ice uh, so water is very mysterious stuff it can come in these three different forms and it can change between these three forms so um, water turns into vapor vapor turns into liquid and the liquid can turn into ice um, and it can move as well and there are kind of four different ways that it moves. Um, gravity, which we know about. Capillary action. Convection. And diffusion. Um, and which way does it move then? Uh, gravity pulls things down. So you know that rain is going to fall on your house. And it's definitely going to fall downwards. It may be windy, so it may be coming at an angle. But you know if there's water upstairs on the floor, it will get downstairs through the ceiling. Um, so we know this. Um, there's also what's called capillary action. And you may have seen very tall trees and the leaves at the top of the trees are green. And those trees are, are pumping water the whole time by what's called capillary action. And capillaries are very thin, narrow tubes. And trees are full of capillaries. And water will just go up and get sucked up those tubes. Um, this can also happen in a building if you're not careful. So if you have a pool of water at the bottom of a wall, there's a, always a danger that the wall is going to start sucking that water up. If you have insulation, if there are thin gaps in the insulation, if you get some water, water will start being sucked up through those gaps. Uh, if you have concrete with a crack in the concrete, if there's water on one side of it, the water will get to the other side. Um, th these are things that you need to think about. If you're building a building, you need to make sure that the gravity water coming down is not going to go into your house and you have to stop water from coming up if there's any water underground. Um, which way does it move for convection and diffusion? Um, convection is water in air. So we remember humidity. Uh, water contains some moisture, some vapour. And if the air is moving... It's bringing moisture with it. Um, and it will go from basically high pressure to low pressure. So the air will move and water's coming with it. Um, diffusion then is what happens not in the air, but within the building, within the walls, within the structure of the building, the, the fabric of the building, as it's sometimes called. And in, within the building, it will move from high to low vapour pressure. Um, so we have what's called vapour pressure. Uh, that corresponds to the amount of water. Not the humidity, not the relative humidity, uh, but the absolute humidity. Um, and it will go in that direction, which is not exactly the same as um, vapour pressure. Um, moisture comes from um, our building materials. So when you make concrete, concrete has water in it and the water will come out of the concrete over uh, a year or a few, a few weeks at least. Um, and 
other materials, the other building materials that you use also have moisture in them. And the moisture may come out of the materials and end up in your wall. Um, it may be raining when you're building your building and some rain may get somewhere into the structure, into the construction. Uh, so we have moisture probably to start with. Our building has some moisture in it. Um, inside the building, especially in the winter, we need to worry about humidity in the air. Um, the air in a building contains a lot of water. Um, outside we have rain coming in or coming down or coming onto, onto a wall if it's windy. Um, and also we have humid air outside. Um, this is um, one example of a danger of, of water. And um, this is something called an ice dam. Um, these are, um, I, I've heard about these from America. Not so much in Japan, although I'm sure this can happen in Japan. And we can see what's happening is it's been snowing. Um, in England, it doesn't snow so much, so this doesn't tend to happen. Um, and it doesn't, the temperature doesn't stay below freezing for very long. So even if it does snow, the snow melts within a few days. Um, parts of America are very snowy, and there can be a buildup of snow on the roof. Um, and some places in America have very cheap heating. So sometimes people don't insulate their roof very well and they heat their house with a lot of heat. And what this means is you've got heat coming up through the ceiling into the roof and melting the snow on the roof. Now the snow starts to go down, um, but when it gets to the edge of the roof, there's no heat at the edge of the roof because that's outside. So you get what's called an ice dam that forms a big block of ice there. You then have water um, coming down from melted snow coming down the roof. And if it was carrying on going down, it would be no problem. The roof is fine for stopping water coming down by gravity. But when there's an ice dam, it's no longer gravity. You've got a pool of water there. The water will start leaking in and will get into the house, and you then start raining inside. Um, this is a danger if you're going to heat your house and not use insulation and live in a, a country where it's cold and snowy. Um, and just an example of, of one kind of danger that water can have on your house. Um, the main things I'm going to talk about, though, are convection and humidity. Um, and these, when we do start to get insulation, we, we do need to think about these things. Um, so humidity then, as you probably remember, um, the amount of water, as air gets hotter, it can hold more water, uh, more moisture. And we have what's called um, relative humidity. So the blue line is 100%. That's the maximum amount of water the air can hold. Uh, the other lines are the relative humidity. Um, so that's the percentage of that maximum. And the curves go up as, as it gets warmer. Um, we may have warm air on one side, 20 degrees, maybe 50% humidity. Um, if that's high pressure um, and the other side is low pressure, the air is going to move from high pressure to low pressure. So it doesn't matter if it's um, higher humidity. Here we've got air moving from low humidity to higher humidity and it will take its um, moisture with it. Um, if the air pressure is the same, um, in this situation you're going to get humidity probably is going to go from where it's higher relative humidity to lower relative humidity. Um, probably. But it may depend on the on what's called the vapor pressure. Um, but we can see this um, uh, just to see the, these are um, the humidity and the temperature outside and inside, and we can see these fluctuating. So as this is going, this is over a few days. Um, in the daytime, it gets warmer. As it gets warmer, 
the relative humidity drops. As it gets colder, the relative humidity goes up. The absolute humidity is not changing, just the relative humidity, because the saturation point is coming down as the temperature goes down. So it's a bigger percentage. And as the temperature goes up, the saturation point goes up. So the amount of humidity is a smaller percentage. Um, if there's insulation, then, if we have a wall, um, let's have the same idea where we've got warm air on one side cold air on the other side um, and if that's high pressure we're going to get the hot air is going to move from inside to outside through the insulation there's a temperature gradient the temperature in the insulation drops as the temperature drops the humidity goes up and somewhere in the middle you get condensation and this is uh, very bad news for your wall because you're going to get, start getting water forming in the wall. Um, this can cause mould, can cause all sorts of problems. Um, so what you need to do really is you need to have um, an airtight barrier and make sure that it's airtight there. Um, and if, it, if it's airtight there, the hot air is not going to go through the wall. It's going to stop at the wall and the wall will be saved and kept from turning into a mould or mushroom factory, uh, which you definitely don't want. Um, so what happens inside the walls then? Well, um, just to think about two things. One is air movement. The other one is water movement. And um, air moves from high air pressure to low air pressure, uh, whereas moisture movement goes from higher vapour pressure uh, to lower vapour pressure. Um, and vapour pressure is similar um, to absolute humidity. So if there's more moisture, more vapour, there's more absolute humidity and there is more vapor pressure um, so we can compare the absolute humidity and we can see if it's in the winter we're 40 percent humidity inside maybe maybe 50 percent humidity outside um, so the relative humidity outside is higher but the absolute humidity is higher inside and it will usually be higher inside in the winter um, because it's usually 10 or 20 degrees warmer inside. Um, and this means you've got something like 7 grams per cubic metre of moisture inside. And outside you've got about 2 grams per cubic metre. So the vapour pressure is going from inside to outside. And the moisture is going to want to move through your walls from inside to the outside. Um, so... What if it's hot and humid outside? We may have the opposite kind of situation. Um, it's 25 degrees inside, 60% humidity. Uh, it's 35 degrees outside and maybe 50% humidity. Um, that's the relative humidity. The absolute humidity, though, um, is more outside. So the vapour pressure is going to be pushing water from outside to inside. Um, let me just talk about traditional buildings a bit then. Um, traditional building um, will use the local materials. So if there's stone nearby, they'll use stone. If there's wood nearby, they'll use wood. If there's slate, they'll use slate. Um, they will use local techniques. So often there are building techniques that are used in one area and those are the traditional techniques uh, and also local fuel is used so to keep warm in most places where people live we need to keep warm some of the time um, and some places use coal some places use peat some places use wood um, and traditional buildings often are influenced by the local climate so obviously somewhere that's very cold is going to be concerned about keeping warm. 
Um, and if it's very hot and humid like Japan, a big concern is keeping humidity out and keeping um, the building safe from humidity. Um, also, um, major events often affect traditional building. So traditional buildings, sometimes something has happened in the past and they can be quite a long time um, when that affects the way things are built. Um, traditional builders are conservative. Um, generally, builders don't like change. They don't like to do new things. And there's a very good reason for this. Buildings last a long time. And if you want the building to last a long time, then you need to check a building that has lasted a long time. And those buildings were built a long time ago. So um, builders will trust things that they can see and that they can see work. Um, so new techniques, often builders don't like to use new materials if they don't know how to use them. They don't like to use new methods or new technologies. Um, if they haven't tried something many times, they don't want to use it. Um, and this often means that um, new materials or new techniques come on and often they cause problems. And this can encourage builders to stop using those new techniques or new materials. Um, so this is a... Um, this is a big threat. The biggest threat in most places to traditional building, in most buildings, in fact, a big, big threat is moisture. And if we look at a, a, a typical traditional building often has a fire inside um, and the fire obviously keeps the building warm, which is nice um, because it's keeping the building warm. That's also driving away some moisture because raising the temperature, um, the relative humidity drops. Another thing, uh, so this can, the heat from the fire can dry out the walls and stop the walls getting wet. Another thing that's happening, because the fire is burning and sending smoke and heat out of the chimney, as it's doing this, it's sucking air in. So it will tend to keep air from outside coming into the house. Um, so this is much less risky than the air from inside going out because the air inside has more humidity. Um, so this is naturally keeping the um, naturally keeping the building warm and naturally keeping it safe from humidity. Um, this is a very nice room somewhere, and you can see another thing that I I tend to think of now as being a traditional part of buildings um, in the UK is these are radiators and um, these will have hot water or sometimes steam going through them and these will keep the windows, these will keep the house warm. Um, they're called um, radiators. Um, how do they work? How do they heat? Um, as we know there are three different ways that heat can be transferred, conduction, convection and radiation. What do radiators do? Well they conduct and they convect. They don't actually do much radiating. Most of the heat from a radiator comes from the radiator conducting heat into the air next to it. That air then moves and moves around the room. So they're mostly convection, uh, in fact. Um, fires are, are radiators. Um, so where would you put a radiator? If you have a room, here's a room with a window. Um, if you put it here, this may not be a terribly good idea. What happens to the radiator is it heats up the air next to it. The air moves across to the other side of the room and hits the window. And the window will then be colder because windows are, are usually the worst insulated, the least insulated place in a, in a room in a house. And that will tend to get cold air coming in from the window. Um, so this is not a very good way, not a very good place to put your radiator um, in your room. Much better idea to put the radiator under the window. What this will do is send heat um, upwards and it will heat up the air from the window. And then the air will circulate and come back 
still quite warm from the other side of the room. Uh, now, the way that radiators have come to be used in buildings um, partly was influenced by the Spanish flu of 1919. Um, and around this time, there was a, a fresh air. There was a strong belief that fresh air is very important from the health for the health, uh, which is true. Fresh air is very important for the health. Um, you do need to keep fresh air coming in and get rid of spent air. Um, but there was a movement at that time to keep windows open, um, even in the winter. Uh, so there wasn't really a big need for having windows um, that were good at insulating. The important thing was that they would bring in fresh air. Um, and this was especially true with the, with the flu epidemic, which um, was uh, another serious um, epidemic, a pandemic, in fact, 100 years ago. Um, the, the, the time heating was usually by steam and most big buildings would have steam. Smaller buildings would have just a small boiler um, full of hot water. Large buildings would have steam sent around pipes around the building. Uh, there will be radiators in each room. Um, and in fact, New, New York City had regulations that buildings must be kept um, over 20 degrees. Whenever the temperature outside below goes below 13, um, the owners of the buildings must keep their buildings above 20 degrees um, and at night time above 17 degrees. Um, also, they had to provide hot water. Um, so um, because of this, there's a tendency still, I believe, in America to have an oversized heater. Um, so to make sure that at all times the temperature is above this level, uh, the heating systems are often bigger than you need. Um, and often buildings inside um, are, are just too hot. Um, which is which is a problem. So this is some this is something that's a um, hundred years later. There are still some building traditions that have gone back to this kind of one event that happened um, a long time ago. Um, and I'll give you another example in a moment. Just over to Japan. This is a house in some kind of um, rebuilding stage, but we can see very clearly a couple of features of Japanese houses. The design tends to be open, um, so instead of having fixed rooms and thick walls around the outside, there are very thin walls or no walls or sliding walls or sliding windows on the outside. There's often a space underneath the building, um, and all this means that the building is very open and lets air go through and... That's very important for keeping humidity, for stopping humidity building up and stopping condensation building up. Um, this is another feature of Japanese buildings. Um, a traditional feature is, is wood only, so a structure that does not use wood. Now, wood is, is, a, is a great material and wooden structures get stronger and stronger and can be can be very very strong and can last um, I saw that I think after a thousand years the wooden structure is as strong as the time it was built and for the first few years the building just gets stronger for maybe 200 years or something so um, wood is a, is a great great material um, and there's a tradition for making wooden joints with only wood and using no nails um, but that tradition, in fact, was um, in Tokugawa time, there were strong restrictions on using nails and using metal fastenings. Um, so the reason for doing this was because the woodworkers weren't allowed to use metal. Um, it wasn't the result of it is, is, a, is a technique that has very strong wood. Um, that wasn't the reason for it. So often these traditions come from events um, or someone's idea that's not always relevant. Um, that's the nature of traditions. Um, traditional buildings, and we can see some similarities 
between Japan and the UK. Um, insulation is not a traditional part of buildings in Japan or the UK. Um, and air tightness is not a part of buildings in the UK or in Japan. Um, for perhaps different reasons, in the UK you often have a fire going. If you have a fire going inside your house, you really don't want it to be airtight. That would be very, very dangerous. Um, in Japan, the traditional buildings are kept drafty more to stop humidity buildup. So if, if the air is moving, you don't get too much humidity. Um, the walls are very different. Um, J Japanese buildings have light, movable, often movable walls. UK buildings have thick stone, um, half a metre thick stone walls. The lifetime of Japanese buildings is relatively short. Um, it's relatively long in the UK. Traditional fuels um, in Japan, I guess traditionally wood or charcoal would be burnt. Um, some buildings in Japan still have a, a kotatsu with a charcoal fire underneath. Um, coal is probably the traditional fuel in the UK that you can dig up out of the ground. Uh, comfort, the priority in Japan is more the summer, which is humid and hot. And the priority for the building is to stay cool in the summer. Um, in the UK, the winters are long and can be quite cold and damp. So the priority is to stay warm in the winter. Um, buildings now in Japan, usually they need air conditioners. So most new buildings, um, almost anywhere in Japan, will have an air conditioner added when it's built. Um, and to stay warm in winter, the fire needs to be going pretty much all the time. Uh, the problems we have now then, we have, um, I think we are now at a time of change where we need to change into a new way of doing things. Um, and the challenges we have are we need to stop burning stuff. We have to stop burning coal. We have to stop burning kerosene. We need to keep warm without without burning. Um, and also people, I think, stay inside more. People spend more time inside as people get older, as more work involves um, inside stuff. Um, houses and buildings uh, need to be more comfortable. Um, the other thing that we have, those are the, the challenges and the problems. Uh, we also have many new materials and many new techniques. Um, so the question, I guess, is how when we look at um, we need to look at traditional buildings and there are many things that we can learn from traditional buildings. Um, but I think we don't want to live in a traditional Japanese building, which is cold in the winter. We don't want to live in a traditional English building which has a fire burning all the time. Um, so where, what, what do we take from these old traditions and what do we need for our new buildings for the 21st century? And hopefully beyond. Um, we saw a building that was built in 1820. Um, perhaps buildings built today somebody will be looking at them in 2220. Uh, so what, what are we going to build for the future?